I'm Rich Lund. Let's talk migration. Last year, I asked viewers to submit potential topics for this season, and then other viewers voted on which ones they wanted to see the most. Emily Herson offered one such topic, asking for the details to be explored as to exactly which generation migrates. When on the calendar and where geographically is the third in the fourth generation? Let's take a look. And just to be clear, the majority of this information deals with the North American monarch population that's east of the Rockies. Perhaps you've heard before that it's the fourth generation of monarchs that end up making the migration, and that's mostly true. It certainly works as a general rule, but there's actually a few more details to really examine if you want to know the full story. I think a good place to start this conversation, though, is just getting an overview of the different generations. Let's start there. Say it's January. At that time of the year, monarchs are overwintering in some very specific places in some of the forests just west of Mexico City. These monarchs are in a state which is called diapause, and they have been ever since the previous fall. This diapause is a change in their physiology, which actually allows them to live for an extended period of time. And it also shuts down their reproductive and mating behaviors. As they head north, females are laying eggs on the milkweed that has sprouted along those routes. And this is happening around March-April time frame. About as far north into the U.S. that this first laying of the eggs occurs is from the southern parts of Kansas all the way to the southern parts of Virginia and the areas in between. These eggs laid, the first of the calendar year, are the first generation of monarch butterflies for that season. These first generation eggs are fully adults come mid-April all the way through May and some maybe even arriving at the adult stage in the early parts of June. And certainly things like temperature and how much food was available to them during development can either shorten the period of time it takes to go from egg to adult or lengthen it. At warmer temperatures, the chemistry is always running faster. And so the warmer it is, the faster development's going to happen. And this is true of the chrysalis stage as well. So from mid-April to approximately late May, first-generation adult monarchs are then moving north, and they're also now laying second-generation eggs along the way too. And by this time of the year, in the more northern latitudes, milkweed has finally sprouted. By early June, this first generation of adult monarchs have made their way all the way up into southern Canada. Now again, it depends upon latitude, but that means from mid-April to the early parts of June, if you're seeing a monarch butterfly fly around, there's a good chance that it's of the first generation. And the eggs that this first generation is laying, we definitely call second generation. These are being laid from roughly May until early June, and so they're going to be developing as caterpillars and emerging as adults throughout June all the way into early July. Again, roughly speaking. These second-generation monarchs certainly mate and lay eggs then that will be the third generation. So third-generation eggs could be laid as early as somewhere in the later part of June, but also as late as the early parts of August. And thus they'll be adults anywhere from the early parts of July all the way into potentially the first part of September. But the bulk of them are happening in that July-August time period. They, too, are mostly staying put in the location where they emerged as adults. They're mating, and they are laying eggs. You may already be noticing that there's some time overlap as to when these different generations are present with each other. And definitely what latitude you're at kind of keeps them somewhat separated, but still, it's definitely possible for a first-generation and a second-generation monarch to be adults at the same time, or a second-generation and a third-generation. So fourth generation eggs then are getting laid anywhere from about mid-July, definitely all throughout August and possibly even into early parts of September. So these eggs that are being laid at this time period of August and into September, they are developing as caterpillars and even in the chrysalis stage, receiving environmental cues from nature that change their anatomy and their physiology. These monarchs emerge in diapause and actually then do not mate, at least not this time. The diapause actually prevents their reproductive systems from finishing their formation. Now, the migration itself begins at different times of the year, and of course, again, the latitude is important. MonarchWatch.org provides this awesome timetable that shows you when the peak migration dates are, depending upon what latitude you're at. can kind of give you a feel for when the bulk of the migration is happening. And this is a great table to consult if you are attempting to use your tags to catch wild monarchs, tag them, and release them. Then you can see when the bulk of the migration is happening and get the most bang for your little tag bucks. As you can see, though, migration is starting already in mid-August in some areas of the continent. But in more southern areas, monarchs might not be on the move until September or even all the way into early October. Okay, now that was all just a brief overview of the migratory process, and hopefully it allows you to see 
why fourth generation monarchs are the general rule as to which ones are going to be migrating. But if we look closer at this, you might see that there's some exceptions that can arise. Whether a monarch develops into a migratory monarch or not really isn't about which number of generation it's on. Instead, it's really all about developing during that time of the year when that monarch will be receiving environmental cues that will allow its physiology to develop differently. The time span from a female egg being laid all the way to a fully emerged and sexually reproductive adult can be anywhere from eh, roughly 25 to 37 days or so. But also keep in mind that a reproductive female, she could be laying eggs, you know, that first week that she became reproductive, but also she could be laying eggs one or two or three weeks later, in fact. It could be that a second generation female monarch, for example, could lay an egg as late as late July. Not common, but possible. And that third generation egg hatches out a caterpillar, which could be developing in August right next to an egg that just got laid, which is fourth generation. And both then could be developing during the time of the year when they may receive those environmental cues that cause it to become a migratory adult. And so yes, it's definitely possible that a third generation egg could be laid late enough in the year to where that third generation monarch ends up migrating. On the other end of this though, we could look at monarch lineage and talk about just the very first earliest egg laid each generation. It's quite possible that you could have a fourth generation monarch adult be emerging in mid-July, when definitely the migration hasn't started and won't be starting for another month or so. Such a fourth generation monarch would not be in diapause. It would find a mate, it would end up reproducing. And thus, if it's a female we're talking about, she could be laying then some fifth generation eggs. And again, this isn't the majority of them, but plenty of fifth generation monarchs most likely happen every year. The key takeaway here, though, that I'm trying to get to is that when it comes to a general rule, yes, the fourth generation of monarchs is usually the bulk of the migratory population. But you can have third generation monarchs that also migrate. You can make it in some lineages all the way to a fifth generation of monarchs that migrate. And it's also possible that some fourth generation monarchs do not migrate. It's not about the number of the generation, but it's about what time of the year that caterpillar and chrysalis are developing. And maybe another thing that your brain clicked over into asking yourself while you've been watching this, if there's so much time overlap, isn't it possible that, say, a second generation male could mate with a third generation female? It is definitely possible. It was also asked if later season monarchs have more of a challenge in the migration. Yes, they definitely do. A monarch that is migrating south in, say, the month of September has strong advantages compared to a monarch that begins the migration in mid-October, assuming they're from the same latitude. Where I'm at here in Michigan, any monarchs that are emerging as adults in, say, September and onward, it's almost a guarantee that they would be of the migratory population. Still, I have had a monarch actually emerge as an adult as late as mid-October. Later in the season, there's fewer nectar-producing flowering plants along that migratory route. And every single day, there's less and less. This means less food, less energy, available for these later season monarchs along that same path. In addition to this, certainly one month later, the temperatures are going to be a little bit colder, on average. And with colder temperatures, this means it takes a little bit more time for those monarchs to warm up each morning and be ready to fly. The weather can also be significantly different in the autumn months compared to the late summer season. With more rain and storms happening from location to location, this is going to usually mean that there's not much flight time during that day. Monarchs might be taking cover instead of actually flying along the route. So it can take even longer during that season for the migration trip to occur. Less food, less energy, worse weather, colder temperatures, they have plenty stacked against them. Female monarchs, though, that end up laying eggs later in the season, they don't know any of this. They just have the instinct to lay their eggs and hope for the best, assuming the animal hopes at all. And so this is why many monarch enthusiasts will actually have an end date that they strictly adhere to, a date where they decide to stop taking in eggs and caterpillars. So each year it can be a good idea to kind of pay attention to how many food resources do you have and really when does it become difficult to try to rear the monarchs if you are collecting eggs. That way you can kind of decide and tweak what your end date will be. For me, I've set my end date in my latitude here in Michigan as being the first week of September. After the first week of September, I no longer take in eggs or caterpillars. Cool topic, Emily. Thank you for supplying it. Okay, I hope you got something out of this episode. I hope it taught you something you didn't know before, and I definitely appreciate you checking it out. Good luck with the rest of your season, and I'll see you next time.